having some issues with our sound system, but hopefully you can hear me. All right, so um, today is a, uh, we're, or tomorrow actually is Memorial Day. So for Memorial Day weekend, uh, this is the time when we remember um, the men and women who have given their lives in service to their country. And for me, it's always a good reminder of Christ who gave his life for us. And so with that in mind, uh, our call to worship today comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us pray. Father God, you are the creator of the universe. You are holy and perfect in every way. We confess that we are sinners who fall short of your glory. And yet you love us anyway. You loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to take the punishment for our sins to die a death on the cross on our behalf. Jesus died for us so that we might live with you forever. So Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. As we come here this morning to glorify your holy name, we ask that you would stir our hearts, that you would draw us into fellowship with you and with each other. Let your holy word be etched into our hearts today, that we might love you with all our hearts and soul and mind and strength. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you please stand now and sing with me, Let It Rise. Praises 
undeniable. We thank you for how much you love us, the love that we can never, ever repay. You are a good, good father. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. All right. Okay. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Got a bit of a raspy voice, but I've been told to speak loud. We've got some mic problems, so not a problem. Um, at this time, our children can be dismissed for Children's Church, and as they're emptying out to the back, I'd like to take this uh, moment just to welcome any guests that are here this morning. Maybe if it's your first time here uh, or your first time in a long time, we're so glad that you're uh, able to join us this morning. Um, you'll notice we have some Connect cards located in the pews in front of you. If you... Um, would like to fill one of those out, you could return it to the drop box in the back of the uh, uh, sanctuary. It looks like the mic's on now. And um, that would just give us an opportunity to know a little bit about you. We could uh, perhaps pray for you or any, answer any questions you might have about Emmanuel. Um, also, if you're here today, and, and this applies to everybody, and you do not own a Bible, uh, please feel free to take one of the Pew Bibles home with you today and consider that a gift from us to you. Okay, a few announcements this morning. We'd like to up, uh, highlight some upcoming events and needs, uh, particularly VBS, Honor the Grads, Mass General Hospital Clothing Drive, as well as our triannual members meeting uh, next week. Please refer to today's handout for more information and details and consider the donation needs specific to the hospital and VBS. All right, finally, uh, one of the many ways that we worship Jesus Christ here at Emmanuel is through our regular generous and joyful giving. Uh, there are one of two ways that you could do that. You could either uh, place an offering in the donation box in the back of the sanctuary, um, or you could contribute directly online as well through our website. Uh, with that, at this time, I'll call Don Ricketts up to lead us in prayer. Don? Good morning, church. Let us pray. God, we thank you for being a God who is immutable. You don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the song that was sung moments ago, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. I think, Lord, that we've forgotten who you are because we no longer fear you, seemingly. We come into your presence and we no longer tremble, Lord. We treat you as though you're a pal, but you're the God that's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, you are so holy that you told Moses, be careful how you approach me, otherwise you find yourself among dead men. We cannot come to you unclean. And so, Lord, we revere you this morning. We honor you this morning, Lord. We worship you this morning. Lord, we lay down our crowns before you at the feet of Jesus, Lord. What crowns may they be? The crown of selfishness we lay down. The crown of unforgiveness we laid down. The crown, Lord, of hatred we laid down. The crown, Lord, of favoritism we laid down. We laid them all down at the feet of Jesus. And as John the Baptist said, may I decrease, Lord, as you increase. Lord, may your footprint increase in us so that when people look at us and walk by us and engage us, all they know, see, smell, and hear is Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's taken up residence in this brother and in this sister. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. God, at this time, we do ask for forgiveness of sins, Lord, because we have not truly, truly given ourselves over to you the way we ought to, Lord. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. The truth is, Lord, it's all about ourselves, and we, we think less about our neighbors, less about our friends, Lord. We are so selfish, Lord. Show us, God, how to open our hands, open our arms, and to embrace those who are less fortunate than we, Lord. Help us, Lord, to forgive. 
Help us, Lord, to have mercy and show love, agape love, to our neighbors and friends and to our brothers and sisters in the church. Right now, Lord, Scripture said we should pray for the government in which we reside, and we pray right now, Lord, for the global United States. We pray for our President Biden, Vice President Harris, and even our local officials, Lord. We pray for Maura Healy. We pray for Michelle Wu, Lord, and we know you're a God of intervention. We know you're a God who can have impact, and we know you're a God of providence. And it does not matter what they're doing, Lord. We know that you are in control. And so, Lord, as Matthew chapter 6 mentions to us, we ought not be anxious and we ought not worry because we know who our Redeemer is and we've seen his track record and it is impeccable. As Jesus said, Lord, of all those who you've given me, I've not lost one except the son of destruction. So remind us this morning, Lord, that you hold us in the hollow of your hands. Praying also, Lord, for Pastor Ames in particular and Karen as they are overseeing the Sub-Saharan ministry, Lord. I pray that as they go through the process of church strengthening, Lord, that you'll give them the strength as well. I'm reminded even now as Moses was about to die, Scripture says that his strength never decreased, never abated. You took him as strong as he was in as, as aged as he was as well. So, Lord, with Pastor John and Karen, as they continue to do their work, give them strength, Lord, and allow those who are alongside them to strengthen them and hold their hands up, hold their arms up when they're tired, Lord. And praying now for our church, Lord, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Remember us, Lord. I, as I look around even now with my eyes closed, I know, Lord, sometimes we come with our Sunday best, the Sunday best smile, Sunday best, the Sunday best hug. The Sunday best, the Sunday best singing. The Sunday best, the Sunday best prayer. But truly, God, you see beyond our Sunday best, and you see the need, the desperate need that we have. And so, Lord, the truth be told, we're here because we're in need of you. As a songwriter said, we are broken, we are empty, and we are lost. And we need you, Lord. So we have come to the place where we know your name dwells. And by faith, we say, if we can but just grab the hem of his presence, we know we will be made well. Help us, Lord, to have faith. And Lord, where we are doubtful, help our unbelief, Lord. And even now, as our preacher comes, Lord, we pray, Pastor Kyle, that you touch him that you open his eyes, Lord, that you collate his thoughts, collate his mind right now, Lord, and as he exp exposits and expounds upon the word, we pray, Lord, that you'd have your way. I pray, Lord, that those who are within listening ear of his voice, that they'll set aside all the concerns right now, table them, Lord, so they can truly hear from you as you speak through your servant this morning. Have your way, Lord. And even before I close in prayer, Lord, I do recall that today is Memorial Day. And so we pray, Lord, for all the men and women, Lord, who never returned home. All the men and women who metaphorically laid their lives on the altar of freedom. That we may experience freedom in ways in which we do today. Help us, Lord, to remember that freedom is at a price, it's at a cost. Help us, Lord, not to take advantage of that and not to squander it, Lord. Thank you for this America in which we live. God, continue to have mercy on her and bless her, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. morning and a great opportunity to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Amen. And thank you, um, our, our media team and sound team, for making things work last minute for us. We got some sound, so that's great. Wonderful. Uh, God often commands in the scriptures of his people to set up memorials we see this, for example, in Joshua chapter 4. After uh, Joshua led the nation of Israel through 
the Jordan River. You, sometimes we forget that the parting of the Red Sea and walking through on dry ground isn't the f- only time that that happened. Um, this happens with the nation of Israel, again, under the leadership of Joshua, being a sort of extension of the ministry of Moses. So they, go, they walk through um, the Jordan River on dry ground, again, as they did with Moses, and they're instructed to set up a memorial in the future when your descendants ask their parents, what do these sto- stones mean? They were to set up 12 stones, one for each tribe of the tribe of Israel. So he said, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. He did this so that all the prophets of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Today is Memorial Day. And today we memorialize men and women um, throughout the history of our country that have sacrificed their lives um, for the cause of freedom. And we remember them today. We honor them. Um, Much as we do fathers on Father's Day and mothers on Mother's Day, we want to honor those who have fallen in battle. Um, To honor our veterans, those who lost their lives. But also we want to remember our God who has provided us with all of the good gifts that we enjoy. So we might not realize this, but when we set up a memorial for those heroes that have fallen for the cause of freedom, we actually remember our Lord through them because he is the one that has given us all good gifts. Amen. Um, I would ask you if you um, have a a relative, a friend, um, anyone um, from your past that maybe has lost their life in battle. If you're currently in the military, maybe, or or you're a veteran, you were in the military, maybe you can stand up in honor of them. And I would like to say a quick prayer. So if you're a veteran in the the military, would you please stand? And I would like to pray for those grieving this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the men and women standing this morning. And we thank you for what they represent. God, today in our nation, we remember men and women, brave men and women who have fallen and died um, fighting for their country. Um, I think of even a young man who was a teenager of, that was in a youth group that I was a youth pastor in who went to Iraq and lost his life, Michael Butho, who no doubt his family, his mom and dad are suffering and grieving and remembering him this morning. I pray, God, that you would be with those who are grieving and help us to remember, Lord, that there is a greater freedom that we need even from political adversaries or danger or harm. And that is the freedom of heart and spirit, forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with you, our God. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless us this morning as we continue our service and be with those again who are grieving this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Actually, turn to James chapter 1, verses 19 through 24. You can grab a pew Bible in front of you if you don't have a Bible. You can take your own Bible or you can follow along on the screens. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 24. Um, We are very, excuse me, 19 through 25, and just very excited to be able to continue um, the study of the book of James together. And I want to thank our brother Glenn and, of course, our brother Ron um, for the past couple of weeks, really bringing an excellent sermon for us to hear and to consider. So thank you, brothers, for this. Would you please stand with me as we read from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is God's word. Please join me in prayer. God, we ask you again for ears to hear as your word instructs. And God, willing hearts to do that same word. Bless us, Lord, with this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. There is a classic Disney movie animated that I'm sure you're all familiar with called Snow White. Have you seen this movie? It sits comfortably at number 49 in the American Film Institute's top 100 movies of all time. And it's sat there for many, many years. It beat movies like Forrest Gump, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Rocky. Unfortunately, it beat Rocky. But there it is, Snow White, classic, timeless movie. The story centers around a queen obsessed with her own beauty, if you recall. Daily, she summons her magic mirror to scan all the earth to see just who might be the fairest. And for many years, the mirror told her that it was her until one day she summoned the magic mirror. Slave in the magic mirror, come from the farthest space. Through wind and darkness I summon thee. Speak, let me see thy face. What wouldst thou know, my queen? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Famed is thy beauty, majesty, but hold a lovely maid I see. Rags cannot hide her gentle face. Alas, she is more fair than thee. Alas for her? Reveal her name. And you know the rest of the story. Which of the seven dwarves might you be? That's not the point. So let's move on. I see a great irony in this dialogue between this queen, this wicked queen, in this mirror, because she calls it a slave. Did you notice this? Slave mirror, she says. But the irony that I see in this is that she seems to be the one to be the slave to the mirror. The mirror actually seems to be the one that is the master because this mirror will not lie. A mirror's job is to reflect, to reveal. That's what it does. And to our great surprise, as we open the book of James to chapter 1 in our text this morning, James likens the word of God to a mirror. One that exposes us completely, through and through. It knows us inside and out. It does not hide anything from us. It reveals every aspect of our lives to us. Yet somehow James claims that this mirror word is salvation, blessing, and freedom. In this text, we read about anger. We read about immorality and being rid of it and so on. But there is a greater overarching purpose, I think, to this passage that we've read. And it's very simply this. The word of God heard, accepted, and obeyed is our life. The word of God heard, accepted and obeyed is freedom. That which has made us alive, we read about earlier in verse 18 and prior. That which can cause us to persevere under trial, if you recall. That which can empower us to flee temptation is that same tool by which we can truly know God and truly know ourselves that abiding word. It is liberating. 
So James gives us very, three very simple instructions in this passage. Hear, accept, and do the word of God. Hear, accept, and do the word of God. So we might approach God's word this morning, even the hearing of God's word this morning, as we look deeply into the word of God, as we peer into, into its mysteries, and, and we might hear from the scriptures the same question that the queen heard from the mirror, what wouldst thou know? When the two disciples of John, the Baptist, left John to follow Jesus, Jesus asked him a similar question. If you recall, turning and looking to them, he said, what is it that you want? And when we approach, the God, when we approach God's word, we must ask the same question. What is it we want? What are we after? The word of God is not our slave. As we look deep into it, it exposes us, it answers our questions, questions we weren't even asking about ourselves, and it always tells us the truth. And this is going to be our sermon this morning. James chapter 1, verse 18, right before our opening verse, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. The word of God is all throughout the book of James. It begins our spiritual life and it continues our spiritual life. The word of God is the seed in the womb. It gives us new life in Christ. It's the means by which our soul is fully developed and led to a complete salvation. That is the word of God. Do you recall that James had just held before our eyes the future crown of life. He reminded us of what awaits us in our eternal life with Christ. Yet he reminds us here that that life begins now, that there is an inauguration of salvation the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, that eternity, in a sense, is waiting for us, but the salvation that he promises us and holds before us is available to us right now, to grasp a hold of and to be blessed by. There is this salvation for us presently, a blessing right now, right here. Whoever looks intently into the perfect word that gives freedom and continues will be blessed right now by it. There is a blessing for you in the word of God. Every day, it sits there. Yes, we as Christians have two natures. Nature is in conflict. But the perfect word of God has all the power necessary for victory in that conflict. For victory over the flesh and over our evil desires. The word planted in you, James says, can save you. That conflict is hard, but the secret, which is no secret at all to the Christian life and to Christian victory, is the Word of God. James calls this Word all throughout his letter. The Word of Truth in verse 18, the perfect law in chapter 1, verse 25, the law that brings freedom in 125. What James is referring to is all of the scriptures, not simply maybe the Ten Commandments or laws that we might think of, the law of Moses, but the entirety of the Word of God. Everything that God has spoken is our power and is our liberty and our freedom. In chapter 8, verses 8 through 11, James refers to the royal law and then the whole, the entirety of the law. James points us in chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, to Abraham, and then to Rahab in verse 25, and reminds us of the prophets in chapter 5, verse 10, and then of Job and Elijah. So all throughout James, in his letter, he's bringing us back to the word of God so that we might be free, which is his claim here. When James points us to the perfect law, which we are to hear and to heed and to do, he is pointing to all of the word of God. And the beauty of our day today as a church, friends, is that we have access to it. We can read it in our own language. 
It sits on our desk and on our bookshelves. And what a wonder it is that God has spoken and that we can be saved by that word. Oh, that we would be in the word and hear the word and heed the word. All of us are under the authority of God's word. All of us. The apostolic teaching that Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, what he called sacred writings, are God-breathed scriptures in 2 Timothy 3.16. And this is a miracle of grace that God would look on us, sinners, and speak to us and save us by that word. Oh, the word of God. Do you know its power? Do you know what it can do for you? This miracle of grace, James says, hear, listen. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to hear, eager to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God declares. As you recall, verse 18, it is by the word of God again that we are born again, that we are made anew. Once enemies of God were made friends with God through the redemption of Jesus, faith is born in us, in Christ, according to James, by the word of God. But we're not meant to remain spiritual infants. We are to continue on hearing the same word that made us born again to begin with. We are to grow. We are to move on from the new birth to the promised, blessed new life that we are meant to enjoy right here and right now. We were not simply saved so that we can go to heaven when we die. We were saved so that we can experience heaven daily, every single day, though imperfectly, Yet we were created anew so that we might reproduce heaven on earth. The old nature or evil desire that we read about, that James spoke about in verse 15, remains and conflicts with our new nature. Forward progress and victory in this conflict is by the same word of truth that made you born again to begin with when we are quick to hear it. You only can be saved once. There is only one new birth. We believe that the Bible teaches that once you are saved, you are eternally secure, that your faith will persevere so that we need not fear losing our salvation and needing to be saved again and again because of personal sin. Once a person is saved, the Bible teaches that they are grafted in with Christ, that they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So there is only one new birth. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14 reads, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So once you are born again, you cannot be unborn again, so that you need to be born again again. While the new birth is a one-time event with permanent effects, growth in Christ remains a continual and habitual hearing of the word of God. It's something that we must keep on doing throughout our Christian life. We must keep on hearing. We must keep on being quick to listen to God, to that same life-giving word which nourishes the spiritual infant body into adulthood. There's an eagerness that I think you can hear in this language. It's not so much a reading plan that James is saying to do. Uh, Through the Bible in a year kind of thing, which are wonderful things to do, by the way, so please don't get me wrong. But James isn't so much talking about how much you read every day, but rather he's talking about a posture of the heart toward the Word. 
A person might be quite disciplined every day to read the Word of God. Yet for some, the only thing we've accomplished is moving the bookmark. Because it's more about an accomplishment for us, a daily task. We might consider David's posture of heart towards the Word, rather than just accomplishing a task, consider the condition of the heart in the task. David said in Psalm 42, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. This is a hearing of the word of God. It's a panting for the word of God. It's a thirsting for the word of God. For the living God, when can I go and meet with him, he says. Oh, that I could meet with him every moment, he says. This is what it means to hear the word of God. Being quick to listen is an eagerness. It's a desire. It's a raptured heart that wants to be on God's holy hill with him. To dwell in his tabernacle with him. To be in his resting place with him as we read so often in the Psalms. So what do we make of this being quick to listen? Of this eager heart that's thirsty for God's word, that pants for God's word. It's interesting here that he says, be quick to listen, yet slow to become angry with others. How do we understand this combination of idea? I think the simple answer is that one is proof of the other. In other words, if you are quick to listen to God, you will be naturally slow to become angry with others. It's sort of the product of a heart that is eager to be with the Lord. We cannot suggest that we're eager for God, that we're hungry for his presence, and seek him in our prayer closets, yet with others, we treat them with impatience and contempt outside of those closets. We are to others in public what we are with God in secret. I'll say that again. We are to others in public what we are with God in secret. James tells us that anger does not produce righteousness. Now that's an interesting word that I think sometimes we define a certain way, but the way James is using this word, it means all that God purposes to do. That's what righteous, the righteousness of, so God is righteous in all his ways. All that God purposes to do. That is the righteousness of God. Can I accept his voice in solitude, in quiet prayer, but not accept his voice in other moments outside of that closet that are more frustrating? Are they not both by God's design? Are not the challenging aspects of life overseen by the same God? Is he not just as righteous in those as he is in solitude with you? The Psalms reminds us, you remember this Psalm, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me. All the days ordained for me. All of your days have been ordained by God. They were all written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. How vast is the sum of them. We know that not all anger is negative. We know this in other places in the scripture. Be angry and do not sin, we hear. But very often our anger anger is negative and sinful. Might we be angry at times more at God since he is the one that ordained each moment of our life. So we think that we're angry at our neighbor, at a brother or a sister or a father for the way that they're behaving or the way that they're they're treating us, the injustices 
that have happened to us, but essentially aren't we, are saying, aren't we saying that the one who has ordained each of our days is responsible for this? So the anger at our heart, truthfully, is at the Lord, if we're really honest. But being quick to listen, to understand the righteousness of God, is to believe him, to trust him. And when we trust him, it produces in us naturally a slowness of anger with those around us, a speech that is careful. Because God isn't segregated to the prayer closet. He doesn't only live in there and leave us to ourselves as we depart. He comes with us. We're not different people when we say amen. And he's not a different God when we say amen. Our response to others reveals our readiness to hear the voice of God in all circumstances so that we are slow to speak and slow to make judgments. Anger in the negative sense, doesn't it banish listening? Have you ever been very angry at a person in a conversation and you have immediately lost the ability to hear anything they're saying? And when both people are doing that, good luck. (laughs) James claims that this comes essentially from not listening, not being quick to hear God and to see all his goodness all around us. Hear the word, accept the word. Verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. For James, the word of God isn't something we hold in our hand like a baseball or lollipop. The word of God isn't something we hold and admire and look at. It's actually something planted in us, something with roots in our hearts so that we cannot put it down. But it goes with us. The word for those given the gift of new birth is planted in you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it is unavoidable. That is one of the marks of your conversion. The word of God is now in your hearts. You cannot escape it or forget it. You have been born again so that the word is planted in your heart. It has a root system in you. You say, how, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, you look to Jesus Christ for your salvation, but you also identify the, the reality of your faith by this, that the word of God has miraculously be, been planted in your heart. It doesn't mean we always listen to it or obey it, but it's there. It has a root system It's something that has been received, accepted into your heart, now inseparable from you. So we must be, if the word of God is like a plant in our heart rooted in us, the spiritual life is likened to a gardener, according to James. We must be about the business of spiritual gardening. We must weed the garden. We must be rid of those items that will crowd out the soil and choke out the fruit. So James says, be rid of moral filth and evil. Get rid of this um, immorality and evil that is present. If we accept the word, we will be about the business of purging everything that undermines the word in our life. We are gardeners and the spiritual sense. We weed out sin and we apply meekness or humility so that by the word we grow. You know, we've, we've said this a few times today already, but we have opposition. The redeemed person has opposition. The remaining sin, the flesh, the old sin nature, the Adam, as you might have heard, remains in us even as God's children. So that remaining sin brought on by this fleshly nature, if 
unchecked by presumption and pride might choke out spiritual life in us. We need to accept the word and hear the word. Not simply hear it, but accept it. Say yes to it. Agree with it. Affirm it. Believe it. There's a job that will never end for any of us, and that job is that weeding job. The flesh, until eternity comes, will continue with us, and because of this, we need to continue to pull the weeds of sin planted by Satan in our own old sin nature. Through this process, the implanted word has the power, according to James, to save your souls. In other words, to win. This isn't a hopeless struggle, but one that James says we can have victory in because of the word of God. We just need meekness, humility. A scholar named Trench defines meekness as a temper of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good. Do you recall we just talked about the word righteousness? That is all the dealings of God in this world. All his actions, all his intentions are righteous. Meekness affirms all of God's righteousness as good. A meek temper, a humble temper admits I don't know because I am not God. I have limitations. So I believe the word of God even when I don't understand. Even when it hurts. He is righteous. He is good. That requires humility. That requires meekness. The the word of God received by a meek heart. That word, when received in humility has the power to transform your life and to save your soul. In the gospel, Jesus, you recall, delivered many demons from illness, I mean, de- people from demons and men- many people from illness. There's a totality that we see in the, work of, in the saving work of Jesus Christ. He saves people from demons. He saves people from illness. He saves people from financial insecurity even. He saves People ultimately, though, from sin. Salvation isn't some, something simply reserved for us in the future, but there is a present salvation, a formation of eternal life that begins in you now, a blessed life, a growth, and in an experience of union with Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now I should remind you, it says in verses 1 and 2, brothers and sisters, the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. So when we are born again, we hear the word of God and we accept the word of God so that we can live out that salvation life each and every day. This is the power of the implanted word of God in you. As we weed out sin and humbly accept God's purposes through his word. It makes us, it saves us, it makes us more whole. So to accept the word at its hearing, to embrace it, as we weed away sin and cultivate humility, is to create the conditions necessary for the word of God to germinate in your heart, to become fruitful. Do you remember Jesus spoke about this in the parable of the soils, the seed and the soils? It was only on the good soil. Things were getting choked out. The sun was burning the the plant out. The cares, the anxieties of life, the love of money. But finally... The seed lands on good soil. And those who heard the word and knew the word produced a crop. We hear, we accept, and we do. That is the logical outcome to hearing the word of God and saying yes to the good purposes of God. We inevitably will do the word of God. 
Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I remember being at some, I I was doing something at my house, and I was having fun with my children, and we were allowing them, I I was painting marker on their face, and they were painting marker on my face. And it just colors and weird eyebrows and mustaches, and, and then there was this loud crash. And I was alarmed by it. I thought someone was hurt, and I ran. And I ran into the other room. Everything was okay. Everyone was all right. But after everything had settled, I had forgotten what was on my face. (laughs) And I carried on as if my face were my normal face. I mean, that's bad enough as it is. And then I began to go downstairs and speak to my mother-in-law, who had quite a good time at my expense. (laughs) Here is a a simple contrast that James sets up, up, up for us. People with a mirror look at that mirror. They go away and they forget what they saw. People with the word of God, this is the contrast he sets up, yet people with the word of God look into that mirror of the word of God and the word of God goes with them or they persevere. So in other words, the mirror doesn't stay at home. They look into the word of God, they persevere with that word, and they act on that word. Both are looking intently. Both have high interest in what is being reflected. But it is what happens next that makes the difference. All the difference. One pays attention to what the mirror has revealed but the other does not. They quickly forget. It becomes obscure. If looking into the mirror doesn't cause you to fix your hair or your makeup, why do we even look at it? So we might read our Bibles for 50 minutes or so. We might study theology. We might listen to really good theological podcasts or attend small groups. But has it changed us? Has it redirected us? Do we have a greater affection for our God? Are we yanking yanking out the weeds of sin as a result of hearing that word? We are not to go away from the the mirror. We're to take it with us. The word of God is to continue on with us. And that in that alone is what results in the blessing that James promises They will be blessed in what they do, he says, because the law of God is perfect and liberating. When we obey the word of God, we are freer than we were when we were prior. Now that is peculiar because in our culture, we think freedom comes from being freed from rules, don't we? Free from laws, that's freedom. To be uninhibited, to follow sort of the impulses of my heart without some legal morality hanging over me, limiting my fun and my pleasure, what I can do. But the law of God here is called a perfect law because it perfectly demonstrates for us who God is and who we are. It perfectly demonstrates God's nature and our nature as being created in his image You know, a law isn't simply don't do this thing or do that thing. Speed limits and stuff like that. There are things called laws of gravity. Laws can be governing principles in the world, not just commands to obey. They're both, but they're more than just commands to obey. And isn't it true that we thrive on obeying and respecting the laws around us. We thrive when we submit to the laws of nature. We are not birds. We cannot fly. 
We need a different diet. So if you respect the law of what it means to be a human and not be a bird, you are going to live a happy and healthy life. Isn't that true? Why do we think it's different with God? When God says, thou shalt not kill, don't we realize that it is because God is a God of life. It is his nature to give life. And when we were created in his image, we thrive when we imitate our God. You see? If God has made us to be like him, then his law is the ingredient for our thriving. It's liberating. We cannot thrive when we lie and when we steal and when we cheat and when we murder. Because when we do this, these laws will bite us back. Might we consider that the reason that there's so much suffering and so much injustice in the world isn't because that there are laws, but because we do not follow them. We have scorned the nature of God, the image of God in us. Friends, here's the positive conclusion. We are most human, we are most whole, we are most us when we do the word of God. The law of God heard, accepted, and acted on is a liberating force. So let me close with this. Would you go back with me a little bit to the law given to Moses at Sinai? to help us understand this a bit. God is speaking to those that he rescued from Egypt and redeemed. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. These are the ones that God gives the law to, the Ten Commandments, those he has redeemed, rescued from Egypt and then meets at Sinai and gives them his law. So therefore, to the, say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. He has redeemed them. And as Christians, we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13 in the book of Hebrews. He gives Israel the law not to redeem them, but as a redeemed people. Do you see this? He gives the law to Israel not to, not as a means of redemption, but as an adornment to their redemption. They have been brought out of bondage already. Not in exchange for a new bondage to keep the law to save themselves, which they could never do. These are a liberated people, and friends, in Christ, we are a saved people. We are a redeemed people, and the law of God isn't meant to redeem us, but to liberate us. The word of God is meant to free us from the law of sin and death and Satan. You have been saved from sin, and now can truly express who you are, and that is created in the image of God. That is freedom. Freedom isn't having a lot of sexual partners. Freedom isn't having lots of money and being able to go wherever you want and not having rules to follow. Hear, receive, and live out the word of God. This is what James says is the blessed and free life. Would you pray with me? God, this morning we have opened your word. And we hear that question come from you to us. What wouldst thou know? Oh God, that we would know you so that we would know ourselves and be free. God, free us from the laws that we make up, from the expectations of parent and teacher, and culture. God, free us from these things. Redeem us by your grace and adorn us with your word. God, I pray, Lord, that this morning we would hear, accept, and do the word of God. And if there's anyone here this morning that has never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, would you come to him this morning in repentant faith and cry out to God, Abba, Father, save me. I am a sinner. 
and you have rescued me as a free gift of grace, not of works. In the death and resurrection of Christ is my redemption. So I hand you my sin, and I receive freely the free gift of eternal life. Oh, if that's you, friend, would you, would you come talk to us so that we might be, be able to celebrate with you what God has done in your life? And God, for the rest of us, would you help us to hear, to heed, to, to hear, to accept, and to do your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Kyle. And would you please stand out as we sing our closing song, We Fall Down. can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Thank you for being with us this morning. Please join us for the fellowship hour. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.